book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. As usual, the words should be on the screen for you. Um, and then uh, also, as usual, let's read God's word together. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Let's read God's word together, shall we? Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may still abound more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Uh, so as we begin 2024, uh, the staff and I, we decided to study the book of Philippians for our next sermon series, and it's going to be a 16-week deep dive, which if you're wondering, is going to take us all the way to the end of the school year, which for the students are going, oh my goodness, that's so far away, I know. It's going to be a long series, I understand. Um, sometimes at home when I prepare I, and do work, I do work at our dinner table, and so my books are spewed out everywhere, and so my kids will come to me and go, oh, you're doing Philippians? This is a new series? And they'll ask very nerdy questions, because they're my kids. And then I'll say, yeah. And then they generally ask, how long is the series going to be? How many sermons? Yada, yada, yada. And I said, 16. And one of them said, what? How? Philippians is such a short book. How do you get 16 sermons out of that? I assure you, as I've studied, I think this is the best way to go. And for your information, some theologians split it up into 24, so I saved you eight, so maybe you should be thankful. Just kidding. Now, more important than all that, as we begin a new series in a new year, you might be wondering, Pastor Pete, why Philippians and why now? Right? How did you come about the situation? And so let me take you behind the curtains, if you will, in the backstage of how we got here. Now, anytime we plan a sermon series, normally I'll ask our staff a little bit before going, okay, hey, we got a new series coming up. Any ideas, any thoughts, suggestions, right? What you got? And usually they'll defer to me in some ways because it's part of my role as lead pastor. This is what I do. But always I want to leave open the space that they can contribute and then more so we open the space for the Holy Spirit to lead us in a different direction if that's where we need to go. But the staff know, and I know, that when I ask the question, hey, new sermon series coming up, any ideas? They know that I've already been long thinking and planning and so they usually defer to me and that was the case this time around. And so... In the case of 2024 and this new sermon series, the book of Philippians has been on my heart for some time, and here's why. And there's three reasons. First, it's Paul's feeling for and about the church in Philippi is the way that I feel about you. Second, Paul's heart and desire for the Philippians, what he wants to say, matches what I feel I would like to say to you. And then third, that the message of the letter, therefore, the thing that Paul wants to tell the church in Philippi, in my opinion, is wholly fitting and appropriate for us. Where we are now, how we got here, and in consideration of where we are headed, I feel that this is totally appropriate. You see, Philippians has actually been one of my favorite books. It's, it's been a favorite book of mine for quite some time. I've done a good amount of work in it. Um, a little interesting fact, I've actually taught this as a Korean Bible study to our Korean adults three or four times, which may surprise you. Some of you might probably think I can't even speak Korean, but that's besides the fact. I love this book. And so because it's a book that I've known for a while and that I've loved for a while, you can probably understand I've been holding on to it for a little while, hoping one day that it'll be fitting as the book that we want to look at. And I feel that the time is now. And so today, as we introduce the book, better the letter of Philippians that he writes to the church in Philippi, and as we set the groundwork and the framework for the series, we're going to go through these three reasons I set out earlier 
right? Paul's feelings for the church of Philippi, therefore my feelings for you. Paul's heart and motivation, therefore my heart and motivation. And then Paul's main message, and therefore what I hope will be the main message for you, I believe, is what we need now to go forward, I think, to where God is taking us. Okay, so let's go through these quickly. First, Paul's feelings for and about the church. Simply put, if you had to summarize it in one word, Paul's feelings for and about the church in Philippi simply is friendship. Deep, intimate friendship. Or for me, better, it's family. In the immortal words of Lilo to her alien friend Stitch, she said it's Ohana. Ohana means family. Family means nobody gets left behind and or forgotten. You see, although Paul, throughout his life, had journeyed through many, many different areas on multiple missionary journeys to different parts and cities of the world, and therefore established many churches in those cities, his relationship with the church in Philippi, well, it's just different. It's special. It's deeper. The connection is unique, if you will. And this isn't Paul playing favorites, not at all. If you consider their history, we'll talk about that a little later, how the church started, how it all became to be, and how they continually knew each other throughout time, you'll realize that this relationship was just different. And you may have a few relationships like that in your life where it's not about favoritism, it's not about anything, but some relationships just hit different, don't they? Let me give you an example. I have a friend, his name is Pastor B, good looking man right there. He's actually our guest speaker for our college retreat. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal person and speaker. I highly encourage you if you're in college or high school senior, come and join us. If you're not, find a way to volunteer. That's how you can go and be there. But I don't talk to B actually all that much. Maybe once, twice a year at most. But every single time I talk to him, for whatever reason, it's just different. It's as if we always talk. There's a special connection, a bond and understanding. The way that he described it to me is, Pete, he says, no matter what, I know, and I will forever know, that you're my brother. To me, I heard it as, you are my ohana. Deep, intimate friendship. So deep, in fact, that it's like family. You see, if it was about favoritism, I would talk to B all the time, and I just don't. That's not the way our relationship works. I talk to Christina all the time, because she's my favorite person in the world. My kids know this, and that's not a secret. So I talk to her all the time, but that's not why this is the case. So although Paul equally loves and cherishes all the churches that he's been a part of and helped start, this church in Philippi and Paul, it's just a little different. And you can see this actually through the letter and the way that Paul writes the letter. A theologian by the name of Gordon Fee says that what makes this letter unique opposed to all the letters that Paul has written is that it is written in such a way that everyone in that time, the readers of Paul's time, would have immediately recognized and said, ah, this is a letter of friendship. And it's all the different components that scream a letter of friendship. Someone you would write. Something you would write to a dear friend. Verse uh, 3 of chapter 1. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Or verse 8. For God is my witness, he says, how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus, which is quite a lot of affection if you know how Christ feels about us. So if you compare the way that Paul writes this letter versus the other letters, and most of the New Testament are his letters, then you'll see that this letter, it's just a different tone and feel to it. And this is because, largely, their relational history, as I mentioned earlier. Let me briefly summarize. It happens, most of this happens in Acts chapter 16, so you can go read about it. Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, they're doing missionary journeys. And they think that their mission is supposed to go to the province of Asia. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit basically says, no, Don't go there. It happens in verse 6 or 7. They passed to the Phrygian, Galatian, region. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. He said, no, stop. Then in verse 9 of chapter 16 of the book of Acts, Paul gets a vision. It's a Macedonian man asking to come to Macedonia to help them because they need lots of help. And Philippi is the leading city of Macedonia. So Paul, being in Philippi in the first place, was a total work of God. That's not where he wanted to be. And then when he gets there, crazy things start to happen. First, they're not even trying to do any missions work. They just go and try to find a quiet place to pray. So they go next to a riverside, and there happens to be a bunch of Jewish women gathered there. Lydia is one of them. She's the first convert in Philippi, and her entire household gets baptized. Then, right after this, they're leaving that area after having had a wonderful time of prayer, and then they meet a slave girl who is demon-possessed. And Paul begins, and he 
frees her from said demon possession, but also from her slavers. And then her slavers get really pissed. Why? Because they were using her to make money. Basically, her demon possession allowed her to be a fortune teller of kinds. And so they would utilize her, take advantage of her, and use her to make money. If she's freed from that demon, then no longer the money source. And so they get really angry and they throw Paul and Timothy in jail. And then while in jail, Paul, as he would like to do, begins to worship. And at midnight, he begins to worship. And then all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. But interestingly enough, during the middle of an earthquake, the jail and its structures is completely fine, but only the doors of the prison and the chains on the prisoners all of a sudden are released. Like magic. I know, it's just God's miracle. So then they all start to escape the jail, and then the jail guard, right, the prison guard, realizes, oh my goodness, all of my inmates are running amok and they're about to be free. My life is over. So he tries to kill himself, and then Paul stops him, And then in that place, he is saved. He's so happy that he invites the prisoners to his house and they begin to worship. Then the next day, the government finds out about all that happened and then all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, Paul, this dude, he's a Roman citizen. We can't do nothing to him. So then they go, hey, how about you actually leave our city and just leave us alone because something wrong with you, something crazy about you. And as he leaves, he goes back to Lydia's house to take a break, and what he finds there is that all the Christians that have become Christians over the last little bit are now worshiping there together. Essentially, long story short, Paul started the Philippian church by doing nothing. It just happened. And then if you track their history throughout, every single time Paul is in need, every single time he goes through suffering, every single time he tries to do some sort of ministry, like collecting an offering for another suffering church, though the church in Philippi was generally the poorest of the churches, they would always send money, materials, people. They just love each other. And it's not because they're around each other. They're actually not, but they still just have this special, special bond. And let me tell you, this church, fam, this is how I feel about you. Now, I know Paul and I are a little different. I've only pastored two churches, thanks be to God, one in Vancouver when I was in school, and then here at KCPC in Houston. But in April, in a a short few months, I will have finished 11 years at our church. If you do the math, I'm 40. That means I was 29 when I got here. Apologies to my daughter, but when we first got here, she wasn't even a thing, not even an idea. I've known people in this room longer than I've known my daughter. That's how long I've been here, which is, I guess, an interesting thing to say. But I'm beginning to realize more and more the longer that I'm here that just how blessed I am to be able to call y'all my church. More my friends, but most my family. These last two weeks I've been away speaking and over the last 11 years I've had lots of opportunities to go speak in other places. And interestingly enough, especially the last six, seven, eight years or so, every time I go somewhere else, do you know what I talk about all the time? You. My family, my church, and then my city. That's it. What I'm known for, actually, in a lot of different places now, is the dude who just won't shut up about Houston and KCPC and his family, and then Texas barbecue, because that's a big part of the picture, if you know. Now, for some of you who are newer, you're wondering why. It's not just because of longevity. For those of you who've known me for a long time, you know that we've gone through a lot together. Or more so, I've gone through a lot over the last 11 years, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the church and the support and the love and everything that you've done. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for y'all, and I wouldn't be me now if it weren't for y'all. And so you, y'all are people I love. Y'all are Ohana. You're family to me. But also, in consideration of that, I think the way that Paul looks at it, what God is doing in our midst is really special. I hope you know that. The way that we're pursuing intergenerational English ministry in one united church, KMNM, at a church of our size, is quite unique. It doesn't happen in very other places in the country. I'm not just trying to brag. It's you that I'm bragging about. When I tell people that this is what I get to see every single Sunday, sixth graders all the way up to, we won't mention how some of the oldest people are in here, but to the oldest members in the congregation, the way we all gather together and the way that worship is, they go, wow, that's crazy. At a church that big? Yeah. And then I tell them about things like this. That's us when we prepared Pimpimpap in June. And then I go, how many servings is that? I go, oh, this time was kind of small. We're still recovering from the pandemic, 850 to 900. They go, what? That's purgogi, carrots, whatever, whatever, pop, so on and so forth. That's only 450 of those. Y'all did that. 
And they go, what? That's amazing. And then I tell them we do things like Teva 44 body worship. Youth and adults all over the place. And they go, what? And then my favorite, get this picture. I found this on our church website. Wow, what a sight. So many beautiful people on that stage. And they go, wait, that's what y'all do? And I go, yeah. And when I tell them about all these things, what they always say is this, I wish I could visit y'all. It sounds so wonderful what God is doing down there. And then, of course, it gives me more opportunity to talk about you. And then I say, come through. We'll treat you well. And you'll find out Houston's the best city and our church is the best church. That's how this goes. By the way, last week, I wasn't here. But John Kim, the brother of Danny Kim, who's looking for the swab donor, he came in here and then he sent me three emails this week gushing about how y'all welcomed him, loved him, were so great and generous to him. He sent me flowers. AKA he sent y'all flowers, but I received it on your behalf even though I wasn't here. It's on my desk. I almost brought it up just to show you. It's beautiful. Come check him out in my office if you wish. Family, this is how I feel about you. I could not imagine being anywhere else but here. And I can't pick a better scripture that allows me to share my feelings with y'all quite like the Philippians. And one last little note. If you notice throughout scripture, Paul says y'all like eight times. So there you have it. Then second, Paul's desire and heart for the Philippians. Interestingly though, the church in Philippi at this juncture when Paul writes, a church that he loves and adores, well, they've been going through some things and it hasn't been all that good. And at the time that Paul writes this letter to the church, they're at a very critical juncture because of many things. But the point you've got to take away is their spiritual vitality, their will and desire to persevere through the difficulties, keep living for Jesus, is dying. And they know it, and everyone else knows it. Now, here's why. A few things. They had opponents called Judaizers, basically people who would infiltrate the church and are trying to make Christians back to Jews. And their, their, their sense and their force was growing, growing, growing. And because of this, then people started wondering whether the Christian faith was enough to sustain them in difficult times. We'll see that in chapter 4. Then disagreements, distrust, self-seeking motives, self-interest, right? Selfishness begins to infiltrate and are born out of the church. Even the leadership starts to begin to fray and divide and have dissension. We'll see that in chapter 2. And so because they knew they were struggling so much, a couple of the leaders got together and they go, all right, we got to do something about this because we're not going to make it if we continue at this pace. So they send one of their beloved, Epaphrodites, to Paul. They send with him material goods, right? Things that Paul's going to need in prison. By the way, in those days, prisons were nasty and terrible. And Paul was in the worst prison. He was literally like in a box, dark box like this big. And that's, they would like lower food down to him and all, it was, it was nasty. So you have to take care of your prisoners. If they don't, then the prison's not going to take care of you. It's not like our prison system or any other in the modern world. So they send Epaphrodites, but they send him hoping to do a little bit of a switch hoping that they would get back Timothy, who's there taking care of Paul. Why? Because they think that Timothy is going to be this force that's going to help them to recover. But Paul, because he knows his needs, by the way, he's under the law. Uh, he's basically waiting to attest trial to Emperor Nero, who's one of the craziest emperors in the history of the world. You can go look him up. He's nuts, certified, right? And so he's in some straits, and so he goes, no, 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 I can't send Timothy back. So he knows that the time that it is, it's a very interesting time for them. He's going to send back Epaphrodites with this letter. They're going to be disappointed that they get back Epaphrodites, and so he has to say something to him. The Church of Philippi is at what they call a fork in the road a turning point, if you will, an inflection point that could alter the direction and the end destination for the church in Philippi. And so Paul's heart and desire for them, the reason he writes this letter, is to encourage them, strengthen them, teach them, remind them of who God is, what the gospel means, and why the gospel way is indeed the best way. Paul recognizes even though they're going through a lot of stuff, this is the best opportunity perhaps to speak in a very powerful way to encourage them and say, hey, we need to live this way. And church, let me tell you, this is my heart for you, why I've chosen this book as our next series. Now, don't misunderstand me. We as a church, I don't think, are undergoing great suffering. Quite the opposite, actually, as you'll see in a little bit. Now, having said that, of course, there's always individuals among us who are undergoing suffering. That's just going to be the reality of life always. But I think generally as a whole, we are not suffering. I think we're doing quite well. But I still do feel that we're at an inflection point, a turning point, a fork in the road, if you will. And here's why. 
First, and thankfully, we're finally done with the pandemic. We live in a post-pandemic world. Thanks be to God. And on top of being out of a post-pandemic world, we're also post a lot of different changes in our church. Changes in leadership, changes in the way that congregation looks. We've now unified multiple different English congregations into one, all these different things. And thankfully, as a result of all of that, I believe that we've stabilized in many ways. Thanks to Pastor John's leadership, and many people who serve the youth so faithfully, many of the youth have returned. We've stabilized. Each week, a hundred or more of you gather. And that was something that we didn't think was going to happen for quite some time. This past retreat, there's the picture. We had 120-ish of our students and 50 to 50 volunteers to go. It's 170 people. That, by the way, I, I hope you know, this is a KCPC thing. That's not a retreat. That's a conference. That's, that's a stupefying number of people that you have to be in charge of, and that's what Pastor John is doing. This is pre-pandemic numbers when they're at their peak, and indeed, God has been so good to us. This worship, each and every single Sunday, is a dynamic place of worship. The last couple of weeks, I've had people visit our church, friends of mine in the city, because their church were on break or for whatever reason, and so they come in here, and what they told me was that this place, us, our church, our family, they, we, y'all, love to worship. We're also growing at unprecedented rates. I talked about the newcomers luncheon that's happening literally right next door over here. Did you know we invited 25 people and we missed people too because I'm forgetful, I apologize. Almost 30 people in the last three months. Do the math. If you sustain that, I hope we don't because I just can't handle it. God, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm weak. But if we, if we sustain that, that's 120 newcomers in one year. That's not... That's not cool on some level. We don't have the space. There's a whole bunch of different things. But anyways, that's happening. And of course, all of this is great. And so you might be wondering, well, then Pastor Pete, why are we at this turning point, inflection point, fork in the road? Our situation is nothing like the book of Philippians. And the reason is this. Although God has been so good to us in the past few years, every theologian and pastor in the world right now knows that the post-pandemic world we live in is just different. Regardless of whether you're a struggling church or a quote-unquote church that's doing well like we seem to be, so many things in this post-pandemic world as a church are just nothing like it used to be. For instance, we used to take for granted that every Christian would think that face-to-face -face worship together is a thing. It's not a thing anymore. There are people who believe that online worship is just as good, just as viable, and just as important. There are so many different things about the world that we live in that are so very different. The reason why I respect Pastor John is because I used to be a youth pastor, but the youth today are different from the youth from six, seven years ago. Post-pandemic youth are not the same. The world is so different. Their world is changing so fast, I can't keep up. I'm raising three of them. Two of them are going to be youth. One of them already is youth. One of them is going to be youth next summer. So as we grow and as we change and as all this is happening, you'll start to see, I think, that in many different ways, we are at a point where we have to decide something, where questions are going to be very important to us. Questions like, who are we going to be going forward? We have to decide that. Or better, maybe, what kind of a church do we desire to be? What is it that we'll be known for, not only to one another in here, but to the world around us? At its core, this question, both individually and collectively, is how are you going to live out your lives as Christians? especially in the midst of this ever too fast changing world that we live in. And although we are growing as a body in many ways, we have critical needs and there's an opportunity for us to think and decide the kind of church that we hope to be and therefore pray that God will make us. We too, I believe, are at a fork in our road. And then as we'll go through the book, you'll see the kind of themes that Paul's going to address that's really important anytime a church is at the fork in the road. Things like unity and togetherness. As we will grow, church, I hope you know, as we strive to unite, not only as an intergenerational community here in the English-speaking side of things, but as a united Korean-American church, many people will tell us it's easier if you distinguish, a.k.a. it's easier if you create distinctives, which is code word for separate. It's easier if the youth separate and worship on their own. It's easier if the adults do this on their own. It's easier to create space and do all these different things if you just start to create more distinctives. But will we continue to choose to be a united church, bearing in mind the many sacrifices we must make to do so? Another theme you'll see is the theme of service. 
how will we as a body choose to serve those around us? Not only at RK, but also all of KCPC, but also those in our city and those in and around the world who are less fortunate than us. Adults in the room, how will you choose to serve our young ones so they feel that they belong to this family? They'll always have a home here at KCPC, no matter when and where. How will we choose to engage the world that needs Jesus so bad by sacrificing our time and our money and our resources to go indeed to make disciples of the nations? Another thing you'll see throughout is joy. Paul uses this word joy in this book more than any other letter he writes. Why? Because he's writing to people he loves dearly and that he writes they would be full of joy. It's not a surprise that joy in Greek is kara. If you hear the difference or hear the similarities, my daughter is named Kara because she is a joy to us and I love this book. It's where it gets its meaning from. As Gordon Fee says, the theologian I mentioned earlier, he says, joy is not a feeling, it's an activity. Above everything else, the distinctive mark of a Christian is joy, the ability and the willingness to rejoice in all circumstances. Will we choose and desire, therefore, to be a body of joy that activates it, if you will? So if you consider everything that God has done and is doing and where we're headed, I really do feel that we're at a critical junction in the life of our church. A critical turning point, a fork in the road. And my heart for you is that of Paul's to the Philippines, that you would be encouraged, strengthened, and moved to live out these themes and to live out the gospel, which then gets to the third, his message to the church. I pray that you would receive Paul's message to the church and therefore live it out, because that is what I would like to say to you. Now, in most works of literature, particularly letters, if you ever want to know what the whole point, the message of the letter is, we're taught in literary, uh, literary criticism to pay attention to the verbs, or most specifically, the imperatives, the commands. And the first verb, and therefore command, is found in verse 27. Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come or see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, and that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now the verb is conduct yourself in a manner, but there's three words we've got to pay attention to. Worthy, gospel, and then conduct yourself. Quickly. First, worthy. Now, if you're Korean American, Asian American, or you have that kind of background, whenever you hear the word worthy, you kind of cringe. Because the word worthy to you means good enough. AKA, you're not worthy, you're not good enough most of the time. But that's not what the word means, so you can rest easy. In the Greek, the word is axios, and it actually means that which is fitting, or that which is self-evidently true. Think of this game, the kids game, right? Where you have to put match the shapes and the blocks. It's why they say you can't fit a square peg into a round hole, if you've heard that phrase before. Worthy is a way, or Paul's way of saying, live in a way that fits, live in a way that matches, that looks, that acts, fits the part of a gospel Christian, worthy. Then the word gospel. Paul uses the word a lot in the book or the letter of Philippians, nine times in this letter, which is more frequent than any of the other letters. For example, in the book of Romans, he uses the word ten times, but Romans is four times as long as the word, uh, the book of Philippians. So a huge focus of this is the gospel. We're going to learn more and more what the gospel is throughout this book. And the last, only conduct yourselves in a manner. Now this phrase in English is one word in Greek. It is the word politeiomai. If you look at the word closely, did you notice the root word poli? Poli means state or city. You may know the words politics, polis, same root. So the word politeumai means to, in many ways, live as a citizen of the city or the state or the empire that you find yourself in, which is why Paul later in the book, chapter 3, verse 20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, and as you can see, the word for citizenship is politeumai. Now I tell you all of this because of this. The fact that the people we're writing to is in the city of Philippi is super important. Let me give you a little history lesson. Bear with me here. We'll go through this quickly. Philippi is located in the Roman province of Macedonia. It's in northern Greece, present day. It wasn't a big city by any standards in those ancient worlds, but it became a very important city. 
In 42 BC, Octavian, who later became Caesar Augustus, he wins this battle near Philippi, and then Octavian honors this city by promoting it from a Roman province to a colony, which is basically a way of saying all the people of that province were granted Roman citizenship. And this is huge because not every place that Rome would conquer would get this status. So after the victory, Octavian loved this city so much that he then put what he called discharged veterans from the war there. A.K.A. all the army vets of the Roman army, he would go and let them retire there. So then this city became, as you can probably guess, a very loyal city to the emperor of Rome. And then on top of that, he then decided to take what he calls the Praetorian Guard, you'll see this word later in the book, and that's basically the bodyguards of Caesar the Emperor. So they're the most important soldiers in all of the army, the most highly skilled, highly trained, right? They're the Navy SEALs of the army, and he places them, a training facility essentially, in Philippi, so all the best Roman soldiers train in Philippi. All that to say, basically the city of Philippi is what was called a mini-Rome. My professor said this once, he said, as Rome went, so went Philippi. As Rome thought, so thought Philippi. As Rome did, so did Philippi. Philippi is as Rome as Rome gets. And if you add all this together and you know something about the, emperor, uh, the empire of Rome, you know that the empire of Rome is anti-Christian, which means if you're a Christian in this city, it sucks. It's hard. And so here's what Paul is saying to his beloved friends in Philippi when he says, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. He's saying, I know you live in a city, in a state that tries its so hardest to be just like Rome, to hate you, to make your life miserable. A people that wants nothing than to be another Rome. I know you also live in a city that celebrates its emperor like he is God, their Lord and Savior. But although you live there and you are Roman citizens, remember, more than anything, you are citizens of another greater kingdom and empire. You are citizens of the kingdom, the gospel kingdom, and the heavenly kingdom. Why? Because your relationship with Christ makes you a different people of a different citizenship in a different kingdom. Though you live in Rome, and though you are Roman citizens, only conduct yourself in a manner that is fitting, that matches your ultimate status as citizens of heaven. Now, when you put it like that, you might be like, okay, cool, Pastor Pete. But actually, it's a critical message that you have to hear because many of you, most of you, know what this means more than you think. Apologies to those who are not in the room, but most of us in here are what I call blank Americans. I am Korean American. Some of you are Vietnamese American. Some of you are Chinese American, and so on and so forth. And some of us, depending on our status, may be citizens of another country, but permanent residents here in the United States. And then things can get even more complicated because some of us are dual citizens, like my wife and two of my kids, the ones who are born in Canada. So they're citizens of the US, Canada, but Korean in ethnicity, which makes them Korean American Canadian. Did you catch that? Okay, let's move on. Point. All of you know that where you live, where your ethnicity comes from, where your citizenship is, all that stuff, it makes a difference. Sometimes, before you want to know, ask people who've had citizenship issues and they'll tell you it is not easy. And as you get older, these things get more complicated. For instance, there are some people who I know who lived most of their lives in America or Canada, but because they were Korean citizens, had to go back and serve in the army. Thankfully, I, had to waive, I got to waive this right because I became a citizen just in the nick of time. Lord knows I would not have done well in the army, thanks be to God. There are other different stories. Our family story when we first got here was all a residency, permanent residency, citizenship issue. We got separated, yada, yada, yada. Then beyond the legal stuff, there's all the cultural stuff. If you grew up in, our, if you grew up in America and speak English and learn how to speak it by growing up here versus someone who learned it in another country to speak it, you speak differently, you know that. The cultures are different. For Korean Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Chinese Americans, but I'll just use Korean American because I'm Korean American, I've long said, you got to figure out what your split is. And what I mean by that is like, how Korean are you and how American are you? Is it 50-50? Some of you are like 30-70, that's more like Pastor Chris. 30% American, 70% Korean maybe. Numbers are shifting all the time. He's shaking his head, he doesn't believe so. Or the most interesting one is Pastor John because somehow his numbers come out to more than 100%. He's like 70-70. I don't know how that works, but if you know him, you know exactly what I mean. 
But if you put all this together, you know what this means. Where you belong, your citizenship, where you live, your culture, your ethnicity, all this stuff matters and impacts how you live. It impacts what it means to be yourself. It impacts what it means as a self-identity, all those things. And living in a place that we say is a great hodgepodge of culture, language, way of life, exactly all of that, what Paul is saying is above all of those things, only live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. The kingdom of God. We talked about it throughout Advent in the book of James, if you were here, that the way that Christ calls us to live is simply different than the way that the world lives. We can spend hours upon hours at infinity talking about the differences. But if you look at the way that Paul begins his letter, he begins it very clearly to set the tone. He says, I, Paul, and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. That's your identity if you're a Christian. Did you know that? That's a perspective change. The word for bondservant is the Greek word doulos. He uses it of Jesus when he dies on the cross. We are servants first and foremost. But then he also says, to all the saints of Christ Jesus. Saints are known for their what? Saintliness, their holiness. The word in Hebrew, holy, means set apart. So Paul is saying, basically, because you are in Christ, you're set apart, you're different. You're citizens of a completely different kingdom. Why? Because of grace. The grace that Jesus has given to you on the cross. That because he died for you, you are now a different person. But then he also says, because of peace from God. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, one of my favorite words. And it means harmony, unity, togetherness. Because of what Christ Christ has done on the cross, we are now, by his blood, his death, and his righteousness, right? We are now one. We are unity, harmony, peace. We are saints. We are different than the way the world tells us to live, period. No matter what city you live in, no matter what kingdom you're part of, no matter what age you lived in, no matter what culture, whether Philippi, Rome, U.S., you name it, only live in a way that fits, that matches what is worthy of your true kingly and heavenly citizenship. And although this can mean many things, church, let me highlight two things that should impact us even today as we go. If you are a citizen of the kingdom, if you are a gospel citizen, The first thing it really means is although all of us are very different in so many different ways, come from different backgrounds, different families, different ethnicities for some of us, all those things, the most unifying thing for all of us is that you and I are saints in Christ Jesus. One of my professors said this once, it shocked my world, but it has changed everything about the way that I look at life in many ways. He says, any two Christians have more in common and therefore are more unified than any two siblings of the same family who do not know Christ, any two people of the same ethnicity that don't know Christ, any two people of the same political party that don't know Christ, and on and on and onward. Living as gospel citizens means that we live as one, as family. Let me make it really personal for you. I'm praying all the time that my dad will one day be saved. He goes to church all the time, but I don't think he knows Christ. It also means that although his blood courses through my veins... You are more family to me than he is. That's how different this citizenship is. The second thing that I want to highlight is this. That it means that we must take a look at how we are living and understand what this citizenship, this loyalty that matches the kingdom actually means. Is the way that I'm living matching the kingdom of God or is it matching something else? And again, as I said, in this world that we live in, I think this is indeed a very fitting message, is it not? How are we choosing to live? How will we choose to live going forward? How we choose to relate to one another, love one another, serve one another? So as we finish up this sermon and set the framework for the next four months, I know, long, bear with us then it seems to me that it would be fitting to end with the questions we asked earlier and then a reminder of, I think, what the gospel is from Philippians 2. Church, as you go through this series, I hope and I pray that you would continually pray 
and ask and ponder these questions. Who is it that we're going to be? What kind of church do we hope to be? Parents in the room, what kind of parents do you hope to be? What is it that you want your children to know about you most? Students in here, in the schools that you live in, you don't live there, study in, apologize. What kind of a person do you want to be known as? Church as a whole, who do we want to be known as? In the coming weeks, we're going to dig deep into what it means to be gospel citizens. Not only what it means, but how we might actually then live as gospel citizens. So who are you going to be going forward? But maybe most importantly, may you ask and ponder, am I willing to live as a gospel citizen? Is it worth it? And as you do, then I hope Christ will change us, mold us. As I said, church, I've been waiting a long time to preach this book. And I feel like the time is now. Why? Because y'all, I don't think, know what God is doing in your midst. And so I hope you would take this as encouragement, but also as a challenge. That you would then grow into the gospel and into the kingdom. Claim your identities as saints in Christ Jesus who are also servants of the kingdom. Knowing the beauty of what that means. Receiving the blood of Christ each and every single day, the resurrection power each and every single day, and living out differently. The resurrection life, the living hope, and the lordship of Jesus. So as we finish, I'm going to read for you Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'll just read it for you. It's not on the screen. And the reason why we'll finish here is because this is what it means to be a gospel citizen. It describes our Jesus. It describes how he lived, how he did things, how he thought, and how he acted, therefore. And then think, what would it look like if I lived this way? How would it impact not only me and the world around us if I lived this way? And what does it mean that the king of the universe, the one that cannot die, that rises from the dead, lives this way for me and for you, for us? So receive these words, and then we'll pray together and then sing in closing. This is Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the same spirit and intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. And therefore have this attitude in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard his equality with God a thing to be taken advantage of. But rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant slave and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he then humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, then, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, so that at and that every tongue will then confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Fathers. To the saints of the kingdom of God, and to the servants of Christ our King. May you live this way. Receive the blessings and the fruit of this type of life. Endure the sufferings that indeed will come if you live this life as Christ promises. But then live with joy that does not end, a life that cannot die, and a hope that will never fade. Blessings to you, saints of the kingdom. May you live as your kingdom selves. And love the world the way that Christ did. Take some time to pray and then we'll sing in response.